Good morning, Gospel. Everybody looks nice this morning, all fresh and smiling. Amen. At least the ones I can see your mouth, you're smiling. Um, if, as you came in, I hope you got a, a bulletin. And if you didn't, they're back here on the table. Uh, if you got one, uh, if you wouldn't mind taking this out, it's a connection card. And if, you're, if this is the first time you've been here, or if you're a visitor, maybe you've been here before, but uh, you'd still like to connect with us, we would love for you to fill this out with as much information as you feel comfortable giving. And uh, we just want to stay connected with you. Uh, if you would drop that in one of the black boxes on the back wall when you leave, or uh, you can take it to the, um, the visitor desk, the connect desk. I have another name for it now. What is it? New here? New here desk. Okay. And, and there will be a gift for you there. So you can drop it off there and pick up your gift. But we're, we're so glad that you came to worship with us today. Um, there's some announcements that I, I want to share with you this morning. Uh, the family meeting is tonight at 5 o'clock. Uh, we're going to be discussing a lot of stuff. So we really would like for you to come and you should come. It's, it's your church. You should have a say-so in everything that goes on here. But we're going to be discussing the 2021 budget. And uh, we're excited to be adding new ministry opportunities, uh, added discipleship, and, uh, and new missionaries. So, uh, so please come and be a part of that. Um, You'll hear more information involving, uh, and we want you to be involved in the conversation. And we'll, we'll also be voting on the, uh, the Brock Scholarship for 2021. So, uh, so please come and be a part of that. There won't be a fellowship afterward. I know most of the time during our family meetings, we like to have a fam uh, fellowship and have some food and snacks and stuff afterward. But just trying to be safe in this, this uh, time that we're in, uh, we, we just decided not to have the fellowship time. Uh, for tithes and offerings, there's two black boxes on the back. Uh, you can put your tithes in there. Um, you know, there's envelopes uh, on, in the back on the boxes. There's also envelopes in, at your seats if you would like to put your tithe and offering in that. Drop it in there. Or you can do it online or through our website. It makes it easy for you. Um, our mission spotlight this week is, uh, is the Walls family. And they are our missionaries to Taiwan. Uh, they've just started their second church plant. And, uh, and that's really exciting. Their first one, uh, they've, they're purchasing some property now. And they are still in need of about $116,000 that they're trying to raise, uh, and they're the, they have a national pastor, so, so that's exciting to see things that we're supporting uh, to, to see them come to fruition and, uh, and the, the, the gospel being preached in these other countries. So be in prayer for them. Um, we're, we're also, for our local um, uh, pastor is... Uh, is Frederick, I forget his last name, Clement. Frederick Clement, he was here a few weeks ago and preached on Sunday morning. Our attendance was really low then, but if you were here, you remember him. He was a black pastor from, uh, he's doing uh, first, from one family. He's doing one family mission, uh, and that's over in the Meadowdale area uh, over in Dayton. And uh, we may have some opportunities to support, th support them, and that will be a great thing, too. Um, Eitzen Road, just an update on the Eitzen Road property. Uh, we did have some, uh, some people that's interested in that. They've walked through a number of times and looked at the building, looked at the outside. They're working on some numbers to see what kind of an offer they can make. So... Uh, be in prayer for that, that God would help us get that building sold and that that could be kind of out of our life because we still have to maintain it. 
still have to do the utilities and everything. So it would be good if God would see fit to bring someone else in to, to purchase that property. And we can use that money in ministry here. Okay, um, that's all I have in announcements unless someone else has something. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you today that we can come into your presence, that we can sing praises to you, that we can hear your word proclaimed. God, that we can visit with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I just pray that you would just continue to touch the, the lives of the people of gospel. God, there are so many people that, that have had this COVID or that has it now that's struggling with it, and we just want to lift them up to you and pray that you would touch them with your healing hand, that, uh, that they might be able to overcome that virus and, uh, and get back into the fellowship. God, we're praying for uh, a healing, for not just in our, in our country, but throughout the world from this virus. Uh, it's, it's really been devastating for businesses, for churches, for, uh, for, for families. And we just pray that you would uh, just touch, touch our nation, touch our world today, that we might be healed of that, that virus. God, uh, we just pray that everything that's done today in this place would be done according to your will for your glory, your honor, and your praise. You're so worthy for us to praise you. God, you're the creator of the universe. You're, you're creator of each one of us. And God, we pray for our church today because it is the body of Christ. And we pray that you would uh, just continue to guide and direct in our lives. We love you. We ask you to forgive us of our sins and where we failed you. We ask you all these things in the wonderful, matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Stand with me, if you would, please. And we will do our call to worship. It's, it's Psalm 79, verses 1 through 9. And on verse 9, um, I, I'd really like for you to, uh, to recite that verse with me, if you would, please. Oh God, the nations have come into, the, into your inheritance. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in ruins. They have given the bodies of your servants to the birds of the heavens for food, the flesh of your faithful to the, the beast of the earth. They have poured out their blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there was no, no one to bury them. We have become a taunt to our neighbors, mocked and derided by those around us. How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his habitation. Do not remember against us the the former iniquities let your compassion come speedily to meet us for we for we are brought low for we are brought very low help, help us, us o god, god of our, our salvation, god of our salvation for, the for the glory of your, your name deliver us, us and atone us, us for our sins for your, your name's sake the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy by god and sinners reconciled joyful all the nations rise join the triumph
Amen. We're going to turn and read from Scripture this morning in Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. And it says, Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Oh, the mercy our God has shown to those who sit in death's shadow. The sun on high pierced the night, born was the cornerstone. Unto us a son is given, unto us a child is Stop 
the Lord Almighty. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for this day that you have given us. Lord, as sons and daughters, we come to worship you. God, we come to take our attention and minds and focus off of this world and to fix them on you. God, help us today just to hear, to hear you, to hear your word, Father. Help us to see your work in our lives, Lord. Help us to be humble to submit ourselves before you. God, we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning we have a special guest before we dive into Luke chapter 18. Uh, You know, at Gospel, we are striving to embrace mercy ministry under the shadow of the cross. One of words, one of deeds that we want to use what God has given us to serve others. We want to use our voice to declare the gospel to the community, to the neighborhood. 
We want to love our neighborhood and we want to love the people that are around us. And so we do that by demonstrating practical love and by declaring the only message that will save, the message of faith in Jesus Christ. And so we want to be advocates uh, for those who can't help themselves or fight for themselves. And we partner with ministries in our community that do that and that are doing that well. It's something that we can't duplicate. And so we want to come alongside and help minister and serve and support. And uh, one way we want to do that this morning is uh, we've invited Annie Sonner from the Shelter from Violence. Uh, she's the executive director there and sees, uh, oversees the, the ministry of serving uh, with domestic violence families that are going through that, uh, women and kids and everyone. And so uh, we're so glad that she could be here today. One thing that I just want to tell you about, this has been a, a month of giving. I'm so thankful for our church and the way that we've given locally and, and globally and again today. Uh, just to highlight locally. Uh, one thing that we did is we had, when we merged two churches, we had a, a community-wide yard sale for several weekends, and uh, we have taken the money that was given through everyone that bought things, $2,600, uh, and put it towards the check that we're going to give Annie today. But not just that, when FCC, First Congregational, was uh, closing out their financials when we merged, uh, they wanted to tithe on what their offerings had been. And so uh, they are adding $2,300 to that. And so today we have the awesome opportunity and privilege to join and lock arms with Annie and the Shelter for Domestic Violence and to give them a check today for $5,000. And so we praise God for that. Yeah. So I want to invite Annie, just come on up, and I want you to share a little bit about the ministry, and she's just going to take a few minutes, and then uh, would love, actually, just to go ahead and give you this. See, if I make you speechless now, then, no, you know, <laughs> then it makes you, oh, that's not good, don't I cry. I my bladder too close to my eyes. Oh, for real. that sounds like a problem. <laughs> God bless you. Hi, uh, I'm Annie Sonner, and I would like to thank you for inviting me to tell a little bit about our program. And I want you to know I've done this for 29 years, and I am absolutely a nervous wreck every time I talk in front of people. I'm so nervous that I actually went to the EUM church and heard half of a song and a prayer. And I think God said, Annie, you're in the wrong church. <laughs> so I laughed all the way over here, and that really helped settle me down a little. <laughs> but uh, the... I am a, a nurse at the Brethren Home part-time now, and I work for the health department. I've been at the Brethren Home 29 years also, um, and I worked for the health department for 12 years. And um, I volunteered for the shelter a, a year before I started in 91 as the coordinator. I'm, I'm actually called the coordinator. Executive director sounds real, real uppity there. So <laughs> I, I say I'm the coordinator. But I really feel like God put this on my heart. I grew up in a large family, um, and I had experienced that as a child. My father was a drinker. And then I uh, ran away from home numerous times as a kid, uh, got married at 16, had my first son when I was 17, married a man who I loved a lot, but he was a drinker, did many other things. So I really think through all of the things I've went through, God put me into this so I could, uh, I understand it so I can help other people. And I so love people, I do. Uh, I especially love the elderly and children. Some in the middle, I could kick their bottoms, but that's who I work with. And um, now I'm an elderly. <laughs> so um, I'll tell you a little bit about the program. Uh, the pastor told me five minutes, and that sounded therapeutic. That's not long. I can live. Uh, <laughs> And the lady, Irene Winterwood, was the ori original shelter person. Uh, in 79 was the very first domestic violence law, uh, 1979. And so that is when the shelter got together some grassroots women. And um, 1980, it became um, incorporated. So we have actually had a shelter program for 40 years. I'm just going through this, writing it down, and go, wow, gee. Um, Irene did it for 10 years, and uh, the year I volunteered, uh, she <laughs> conned me into, constantly tried to con me into doing this. 
And I said, I can't. I can't possibly do that because I can't speak in front of people. Oh, Annie, you'll hardly ever have to do that. And so I started in October of 91, and by Christmas, I had, had, had to talk three times to groups of people. I said, Irene, you lied to me. And she said, it was good for you. <laughs> so um, we have a, a shelter program. It started out as a safe home. Safe homes, the volunteers would take people into their homes. And then we rented a place. And now we have had a shelter for 25 years, an actual house. It's small. We keep it non-disclosed for obvious reasons. Um, and I have two advocates that help me, uh, Paula and Katrina. Katrina's on my board here, and she's been my very best gift from God. And uh, Ellen, Jo Ellen, is uh, my shelter. She's on the board. She's my shelter secretary. Great. I have a great board. Um, that supports me. Uh, I have three volunteers, Tracy, Natalie, and Angela. Uh, we get a little funding through VOCA. We, we took a big cut this year. Uh, and uh, also I get some funds through the commissioners in the county. That comes from the, di the divorce, disillusion, annulment, and marriage license fees. Kind of like, um, and of course, those things are down too. Revenue's not coming in like it did because of the COVID. Um, and so we use what we can at, to make the program work. I've never created a large empire, so even if we take a funding cut, we can still do things. So that's how I believe. And God always has provided. He keeps me laughing just like this morning. Okay, domestic violence is an issue of power and control, and it's many forms. Uh, we give out a wheel to the victims, and, um, and it's an anger issue. Anger is uh, constructive and destructive. So you have to try to teach the victims and their children the dynamics of domestic violence. Um, and you try to teach them what love is. A lot of people don't know what, I'm not sure I know what it is, but the Bible tells it very well in Corinthians. <laughs> Um, and if you put two people, I don't care how much you love each other, in the same space, you're going to have an argument. But you need to be able to have an argument in a constructive way and not use violence. Learn how to solve your problems. Uh, differences without violence. Um, my biggest thing is to teach the kids the effects of domestic violence on them. We give out, the, well, Paula, my... My one volunteer, we pick up the police reports in the city, the disputes and the arrests, and we make direct victim contacts, maybe not personally anymore because the COVID has changed everything, uh, but we leave paperwork in the door, the mailbox, and it's on the effects of domestic violence on children, the cycle of violence, um, and uh, what domestic violence really is. Uh, we leave information where they can call me, um, I, I will meet with them. Right now I do a lot more phone contacts because of the virus. I don't even like to say COVID anymore. I'm going to say virus. Um, and so we try to teach. Uh, before I was doing support groups more on a routine basis, but that sort of changed too. We, we can't meet like that, but hopefully coming down the road we can because I have a lot of educational videos and things, but um, I try to meet them where they're at just like Jesus meets them. I think of that. I think of how they are the kid's very first teacher, very first teacher. So if you can help that, those parents um, with the, the dynamics and try to teach them what is going on and help them make better choices and better ways, um, it will help the kids become more successful, and it helps the parents. Um, we have drugs involved and alcohol in a lot of domestics now. Not only do I know God is real and God works in this program, but I see the devil work too. I see it a lot. So it's, it's um, I say bad things to him. <laughs> um, but uh, we need to keep the family support, community support, faith-based support. And... Um, Many people 
stay. Or if they leave, they go back. So a lot of times, if they want to stay in the relationship, and when I talk about domestic violence, it's mostly the percentage is mostly the male to the female, but also it's always the other way too. I see that a lot. Uh, and a lot of times we have kids now that are abusive to their parents. The kids get older and it's, so if you can teach um, better parenting skills for the parents. Um, I, I teach a mother and a father that kids need three things, three things, and it's not expensive. It's love, security, and consistent rules. And um, just love them and talk to them and ex listen to them because we have a lot more suicides happening now and attempts of suicide. Uh, the drug problem is a problem. Uh, it switches from what they used at one time to what they can afford now. And so um, we have kids that will suffer from, uh, it's called DEC, it's drug endangered children because they're living in an environment where there are parents using. So when I get to meet some of these people and God will put people in my path sometimes in the course of a day and I'll think, why? But it is amazing what can happen at the end of a day, the end of a week, the end of a month. I try to keep contacts with many of them uh, for over a period and if I get to work with the partner they want to stay with, that's always good because they suffer from the same things a lot of people suffer from, but the male doesn't want to talk about it. The word depressed is not a male word. It's, they just don't talk about it, so they cover it up with other things. So if I can help them become better parents and look at each other, and um, I can't really preach to people, but if they're around me enough, they know I love the Lord. And uh, so I get to work it in, usually not in the beginning. And um, so um, 29 years is a long time, but it's yet it's still a short time. And um, I'm not sure how much longer I'll do this. I can't find anyone really. Um, I did find someone. <laughs> but uh, I'd have to, I just want to tell you that you want a success story and I think Katrina is my success story. Hmm. And she's a social worker at the hospital and she's my moral support person. When I feel like I just wanna throw the towel in and run away, she'll say, now Annie, everything's gonna be okay. She always says that it's gonna be fine. And that is so therapeutic to me. Um, but it's a fulfilling job and frustrating, everything you could imagine. Uh, but I have done it so long, now I see different generations of people that were kids, now they're married, and there are many successful things. And uh, so I try to make an impression. I'm kind, and I, I'm very non-judgmental. Uh, I think the best tool I've got lately was a thing that's called ACE, Acquired Childhood Experiences. That has been my very best teaching tool to help people understand what they went through. It's a, it's a, and we do try to use uh, trauma-informed care in our program. Um, but the ACE program is acquired childhood experiences and it takes you back to when you were the kid up through the time you're 18 and you, you have a, a test and it's 10 questions. And you answer honestly, each question you'll put a, a check mark and then it will give me a number, like say, I think I was a four, that's pretty traumatic. Uh, but you, I, I can take that paper and look at it and I know what trauma level they have actually went through in their life and I can help teach them why they've made these choices and help them make better choices and help them forgive themselves. And it's made it a lot more, uh, it's just been the best tool I've had. Um, I think of my, I'll, I'll close with this. My grandpa always said, uh, when you first meet him, you'll love him so much you could just eat him. And six months after you've been with him, you'll wish the heck you had. <laughs> um, Amen. Thank you. Amen.
Praise God. We're praying for Annie and the ministry that they have and really. spiritual depression that's within us and he has an answer through his son Jesus Christ and so so thankful for um, the opportunity that we have as believers to speak into uh, these situations with the word of God and so praying uh, for more of those opportunities thank you Annie for for sharing Luke 18 would you turn there with me this morning Luke 18 looking at verses 9 through 14 this morning In uh, Paul Tripp's uh, Advent devotional, I'd really encourage you to get that if you, I'm, I'm not much into devotionals just because I think many times they replace the actual reading of the Word of God, they can, like we can get, you know, have all these devotionals but never actually like be used to opening up our Bibles and, and reading it on a daily consistent basis, but, but there is some, some great Advent devotionals out there and Paul Tripp is, is one of those and he uh, points out that all of us are very skilled and committed self-swindlers. He says we, we are so good at swindling ourselves and how we carry ourselves. He says from the moment of the very first sin in the Garden of Eden, human beings have worked to deny what is true about them or us. That is that we all desperately need what only God's grace can give us. He says something to the fact that we swindle ourselves into believing that we are wiser that we are stronger, that we are more righteous than we actually are. And that all of us, we need to confess. We need to confess that denying our need for grace is more natural to us than confessing our need for grace. That you and I can be so quick to, to promote ourselves and to show others that honestly, we're good. We're good enough. That we really don't need God's grace you know it's like when someone confronts us that we don't really find ourselves immediately silently in our mind many times confessing we find in our minds that we're defending ourselves to other people that really we don't admit how desperate we really are we don't really want to admit in our own lives how needful we really are we we promote we project something completely different that that we are good that we are Okay. And this morning, what I want us to see from Luke 18 is that there's really only two ways of living. That, that you and I are either confessing our need for grace, that, that we are either confessing our desperation, that we are either confessing our dependence on God's wisdom and God's power and God's grace, or this morning, we're confessing that we're good, that we're okay, that we have enough strength, that we have enough wisdom, that we have enough to be able to take care of ourselves. And so this morning, two ways of living. You're either dependent on Christ and and His blood, or you're depending on yourself. And really, this is the battle and tension of all of our lives. Many people don't even know it, right? Even within domestic violence, they are fighting for their way. That's why conflict happens. Conflict happens because someone isn't getting their way. And that results in anger and different attitudes and different stresses and the way that we actually project ourselves. And so you and I, we have this tension that we are either doing everything we can to deepen our faith or we're doing everything we can to deepen our independence, to do things our way. And so we need to trust in Christ. We need to see that the problem really is us. And so I want to think of the contrast Uh, of the words of the Pharisee and really the tax collector in Luke 18 and kind of look at that together because what tends to happen in all of our lives is these horizontal comparisons, they they tend to to cultivate more self-righteousness within us. That in our own life, instead of having people look at us, we project different things so that they, they look at themselves. If we can make ourselves look better, then we feel better about ourselves. 
You know, this time of season can kind of heighten that in all of us. I know COVID, we're not going to Christmas parties like we once did. Many of us aren't even g- gathering with family. Even that looks completely different. But this, in this season, it's about presence. Who gives a, a better present? Maybe there's sibling rivalry. Maybe, maybe it's like who has uh, the best party or who's invited to whose party. Or, or you know, who looks like the, the most perfect family. Everyone just right. I mean, it kind of tends to be a season where if we're not careful in our own self-righteousness, we, we compare ourselves to other people. When really we need to be looking to Jesus. That our dependence is not on ourself. That Jesus came that we might be dependent upon him. So Luke 18, if you'd stand with me out of respect for God's word, looking at verses 9 through 14 as we read this together this morning. Luke 18, verse 9, this is the reading of the word. And this is Jesus dealing with the Pharisee and tax collector. He, Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. May God bless you in his word. You may be seated this morning. You notice there, as we just kind of walk through this this morning in verse 9, the Lord addressed this parable to some people who had trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they viewed others with contempt. That's what verse 9 says. Some who trusted, who are those people that that Jesus is talking about? Some who trusted, it it really is encompassing all those who are outside the true faith. All those who trust that their own righteousness will actually gain them entrance into the kingdom. In particular, the, the parable was aimed at the Pharisees who were the architects really of the legalistic system of self-righteousness that dominated life in Israel. That's what they're experiencing. The, their theology, which was taught in the synagogue, greatly influenced the people. And as a result of their theology, as a result of their teaching, the people believed that their self-righteousness would actually gain them entrance into God's kingdom. And so in their sinful pride, they conveniently set aside really the clear teaching of the Old Testament. If you look at it in its whole, that they were evil and they were incapable of meritorious works, of of being good enough to be acceptable in God's sight. And that salvation was by grace through faith. And so the the Pharisees and their followers, they, they also represent all those who seek salvation really through self-effort and self-righteousness all who believe that they who who have the power to live a life that please God sufficiently that they have the power in themselves to 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 do that to gain eternal life in the kingdom on their own and that really is still dominant even today commonly believed and and really it's a damning lie that Satan has used to lure people into eternal doom that they are good enough in fact if you would ask most people uh, a poll I read uh, just recently and asking the question uh, you know is it enough just to be good to get into heaven and 60 percent of people said yes The 60 people around us today just believe that it's just goodness. That that if there is righteousness within them, that their righteousness is okay and that gets them into heaven. But that's not what the Bible says at all. Even you think about Paul, the Apostle Paul talked about the the kind of legal system even that was in his own life. In Philippians 3 verses 4 through 6 Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. He says, listen, I I too had reason to have confidence in my flesh at one time in my life. 
I mean, look at, look at my life. He says, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. He says, if there's anyone out there that could merit their own righteousness to be accepted by God, it would have been me. That I was at the forefront of that. And so because of those credentials, Paul was, uh, was advancing in Judaism. Galatians 1.14 says beyond many of his contemporaries, he was advancing and he was rising in the ranks that he was extremely zealous for his ancestral traditions. He says, I once put my faith in the traditions of, of religion, of what was taught, that, that I was righteous, that I was pure. And I did it on my own. I was good enough. But we see a change in him after his salvation. Paul's perspective, it changed radically as he continued to write in Philippians. In Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8, it says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. The gain that I had in the credentials that I had in my life actually mean nothing because Christ is everything. He says... Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. That the greatest thing that I could have in life is the knowledge of who Jesus is. That my life is flipped upside down and transformed because of knowing Christ Jesus as, he says, my Lord. It's personal. That Jesus is my Lord. He's Lord over my life. That I'm in submission underneath him. And he goes on in verse 8. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. That I give up everything. That, that I give up the fame as people looked up to me as I, as I give up my ambition. He says I give it up that I may gain Christ. And so no, no matter how zealous they, they may be for God, the Pharisees in, in this text, none who trust in their own righteousness will be justified. And even in our own life, as we fight for, for purity and, and righteousness, we can do that in our own working, that, that we can strive to keep the letter of the law, that we can strive to do all those things and to be just perfect and be just right. But we know we always come up short. Matthew 5.20, Jesus says, For I tell you, he's warning them, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, he says, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so tragically, most of the Pharisees, unlike Paul, never made the discovery that entrance to God's kingdom cannot be gained by human achievement. And if entrance into God's kingdom can't be gained by human achievement for the Pharisees, it can't be gained by human achievement for us either. They remained really obnoxiously self-righteous. And they were so self-righteous that they looked down on others. They, they considered others to be less righteous than they were. In verse 9 there in, in Luke 18, it says that they, they treated them with contempt. Contempt means that they despised others around them. They, they definitely looked down upon them. They, they despised them. They treated others as if of no account. They considered the people around them worthless, really uh, of no value. In fact, it's the same word, contempt. It's used uh, in other places in the gospel. It describes the mocking treatment Jesus received at the hands of Herod and, and his soldiers. And also, I think of, of Peter in Acts 4.11, used it to describe the Jewish authorities' uh, contemptuous rejection of, of Jesus. They despised, they looked down upon Jesus. And so this morning, the Lord's message that people cannot earn their way into the kingdom of God, it extended beyond this immediate audience. It really has a universal scope and serves really as a warning to all, seek, to all who seek salvation through, through works, righteousness, religion, or, or a system of belief. Look at verses 10 through 13 with me. In verse 10 it says, There two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one 
the other, a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. He says, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes even to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a, a, a sinner. Notice in that text, uh, a Pharisee and tax collector would be considered really just polar opposites in, in that day. They were, they were the most pious and the most impious. They, they were the most respected as a Pharisee and the most despised member of Jew, Jewish society as a tax collector. And again, we've, we've talked about tax collector just a, a couple weeks ago. And so we kind of have an understanding as we come into this. But in the, in the Lord's story, the, the story that he's telling, the two men went up the steps into the temple to pray. Probably around the time of, of 3 p.m., uh, the evening sacrifice had taken place, right? The atoning sacrifices had been made, and, and prayer and worship could, could then be, be offered. And so I want to compare and contrast these two. That's just the focus this morning. So first we'll take the, the Pharisee. In the Pharisee, we see the wrong way to approach God. The wrong way to approach God is by your own good works. And we see that in the pride of the Pharisee. The Pharisee, he stood as he prayed. That was an acceptable way. Standing uh, was one of the ways, kneeling, bowing down, on your face, hands raised. I mean, Scripture tells us in many different places the, the acceptable ways to, to pray. And so he was in an acceptable posture. He was standing. He was praying. And so while standing up really was acceptable, doing so to be noticed by men really was not. Matthew 6, 5 speaks to that. And so he was standing up to be noticed. And so you see a posture of, of self-promoting pride. When you are your own savior, you promote yourself. Your posture is, is not one of humility. It's one of, of self-exaltation. And so his prayer displayed a hypocritical, or really a, a self-righteous attitude. And that's what it kind of reveals to us in the text. And so we see that he was praying. It could have been that he was praying inaudibly, kind of like Hannah did in 1 Samuel 1. But more likely, it gives the idea that he was focusing his, his prayer in, in the direction of himself. He was standing, kind of self-congratulating himself, giving himself an attaboy, patting himself on the back for how righteous he really was. And this was no prayer to God. He gave him no praise and asked nothing from him, no mercy, no grace, no forgiveness, no, no help. There's this kind of this arrogant declaration. He says something to the extent of like, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other people, essentially. It was hypocrisy. His heart towards God it was cold. It was a declaration to God of his worthiness and self-righteousness, of what he had done, of what he had achieved. His prayer expressed his confidence that his own virtue was sufficient for him to really to have a relationship with God. By my righteous, I thank God that I'm not like the unrighteous, but I am righteous. And his trust was not in the righteousness that God had given him. It was in himself. He had a posture of self-promoting pride. But the second thing I want you to see is that he had a judgmental look toward others. And so to make certain that no one, including God, missed the point, the Pharisee proceeded to compare himself favorably to really the supposed trash of, uh, of the Jewish society, the, the thieves, the, the cheaters, the dishonest people, the, the adulterers, the, the immoral sexual sinners. These type of sinful outcasts, they were... They were often associated with the tax collectors. And so at that moment, the Pharisee noticed really a, a perfect example that they had gone into the temple and, and he notices whether it was to his left or wherever, standing far off was this tax collector. Thank God I am not like him. So he knows, notices a perfect example of exactly the kind of person that he was not. The Pharisee would have kept his distance from this person because they would have been seen as unclean. If he even bumped into the tax collector, it would have been sinful. 
He didn't want to inadvertently get near him or inadvertently touch him or be around him. He didn't want to be ceremonially defiled. And really think about that for a moment because this physical isolation really was a statement by the Pharisee of of his superiority, of his his spiritual superiority. That I I am better than him. In fact, the tax collector was someone that was considered accursed. John 7, 49. So I don't even want to be like him or close to him. I am not anything like him. And so because of his own self-righteousness, he had this serious judgmental look towards others around him. But it didn't even stop there. He really has an, an outward obsession with his qualifications. He has an outward obsession with himself. You know, not con- he wasn't really content with saying what he was not. The, the Pharisee wanted everyone, really including God, to, to know what he was. And so then you see in the text that he goes on to proceed to, to list his, his religious credentials. Right? He goes on to say what he is. <laughs> Contrasting himself with the, the irreligious tax collector. Although the the Old Testament prescribed only one fast in preparation for the Day of Atonement, Leviticus 16, the the Pharisee fasted twice a week, normally Monday and and Thursday. And so he he was someone that that fasted multiple times. He he was someone that was careful to to pay tithes of all that he received going beyond the the tithing required in the Old Testament law to, to include such things like mint and dill and cumin and even garden herbs. And so he... He fasts more than others. He gives more than others. But we know that Jesus condemned praying and fasting and and tithing and intended merely to to make a good showing in the flesh, as Galatians 6.12 says. And I I think of that as we have just walked through the book of Galatians in in our life groups, that 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 is us, isn't it? That we want to make a good showing in the flesh many times in our life. We are tempted to be just like the Pharisee, to project ourselves better than we really are. And this Pharisee was making a good showing in the flesh. People did respect him for his outward projection. But it was what was inside that was the problem. And so Jesus doesn't just stop at the Pharisee. He gives us a contrast. He shows us what we should look like. And he uses the example of of the tax collector. And so the second main point I want you to see is the right way to approach God is as an unworthy sinner begging for mercy. That's what the tax collector shows us. And how does he show us that? Well, there's a couple things that we see within him. We see the honesty of, of this tax collector. And so, so this second character, the, the tax collector, he, he manifested really a, a radically different attitude to that of the proud Pharisee. If you notice in the text, his, his self-reflection led him to, to, to really lament and to, to lament in humility. He says, he says there in verse, tw- verse 13, but, but standing afar off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a, a sinner. Even in the temple, he wouldn't get close to where everyone else was in praying because he felt unworthy. He wouldn't raise his head in pride. Like, look at me, look where I'm standing, look where I'm praying, notice me. He's in the background, he's kind of obscure, he's with his head bowed, and he's beating on his chest, not in pride at looking what he just accomplished. Uh, Saturday football, Sunday football, you'll, you'll, you'll probably see this today. Why? Because they just ran for six points? Or they just accomplished something? He's beating his chest with his head low in humility. What a great picture for for us. We see within him. And so he's lamenting the humility, which was revealed by his location and standing, standing back from the holy place, back as far as he could get, a distance away. He was kind of on the fringe, as we just noted. He was the outcasted sinner, not only in his own eyes, But really, importantly, he also knew it it was in God's eyes. And so we get this contrast that that when you know you need a Savior, look at his posture. He has a posture that demonstrates meekness. 
When, when I know I need a Savior, my posture, how I carry myself, is not one of pride. It's, it should be one of, of meekness. Unlike the Pharisee who stood proudly displaying his, his supposed virtue and spirituality, he was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven. It shows us that he is overwhelmed with guilt, that he is overwhelmed with shame, and he had an overpowering sense of his own unworthiness and, and alienation from God. His sin, disobedience, and, and lawlessness brought him pain, along with fear, along with dread of the deserved punishment that he should receive. But notice then in verse 13 again, you see a humility. It's seen in his conduct. His, he was beating his breasts. You know, when they prayed, the, the Jewish people sometimes put their hands over their chest and put, put their eyes down. And so this man, he, he, he did something unusual, clenching his hands into fists. He began pounding his chest rapidly and repeatedly in, in a gesture, gesture used to express the most extreme kind of sorrow and anguish. There's only one other reference that we see in, in the New Testament of this practice in Luke 23, 48. It records that after Christ's death on the cross, all the crowds who, who came together for, for this spectacle, spectacle, when they observed what had happened, they began to return and they began beating their, their breasts. They were in sorrow. The gesture acknowledged that the heart is the source of all evil. But notice also the, the words the tax collector spoke. It reveals his humility. Unlike the Pharisee, this true repentant uh, tax collector actually addressed his prayer to God. <laughs> in, in most versions, it does say there, there that we see that he was a sinner. In the New American Standard Version, it says that he was the sinner. Kind of reminds us of, of, of Paul's words in 1 Timothy 1.15. The, the saint is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. And so we see this confession from, from the tax collector. We see his extreme and deep sinfulness. It shows that compared to others, he viewed himself as the worst sinner of all. And so they were polar opposites in terms of their status in society. The tax collector and the Pharisee, they had a lot in common in their beliefs. Both understood the Old Testament to be God's revelation. Both believed in God as creator, as lawgiver and, and judge who is holy and righteous and at the same time merciful and gracious and, and compassionate. Both of them believed in the sacrificial system, the, the priesthood, the atonement, God's forgiveness of sin. They understood how, how things worked. But there was a crucial difference. The tax collector repented and sought forgiveness by faith. While the Pharisee did not repent but sought his forgiveness through his own righteousness or through his own good works that he was doing. The tax collector, you notice, expressed his repentant faith in his plea, God, be merciful to me. Merciful, it translates to, to a form of the, uh, of the, word, of the verb which kind of means to, to appease or to make propitiation or to, to make satisfaction. And so we see this is not a general plea for mercy. He's crying out to God that God would provide an atonement for him, a sacrifice for him. God, I am unworthy. I cannot do this on my own, in myself. It's only through you. So you, God, be merciful to me. In verse 14, notice what Jesus' response is. As he tells this story, he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. That this tax collector is justified. You know, this stunning statement by the Lord shocked even the, the legalists that were in his audience, absolutely shattering what theological insight that they actually had. We notice there, justified is a perfect passive participle that literally means having having been permanently justified. It means it's done, that it's been accomplished. There's nothing that this man could do to be justified. It was done through Jesus in his own 
humility. And so moreover, Jesus did not appeal to, to, to some kind of authority in this moment. His, his declaration, I tell you, asserted his absolute divine authority that he had. So it wasn't, it wasn't as a rabbi. What I mean is it wasn't as a rabbi looking to his rabbi authority. He was saying, I have this divine authority more than just a teacher, a good teacher, more than just a, a rabbi, but I am God who justifies this man. How incredible is that? To think about Jesus coming in the flesh. And so without any works, without merit, without worthiness, without law-keeping, without moral achievement, without spiritual accomplishment, without ritual, without good works, or, or other kind of activity, this guilty sinner was pronounced instantly and permanently righteous. The only righteousness acceptable to God is the perfect righteousness that no amount of human effort can earn. It's not that you were infused with righteousness. That's what Catholics believe. Catholics believe that there is this infusion of righteousness within them and on that basis of their righteousness that they are acceptable before God. But the Bible clearly teaches that it's the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. That when God looks at you, when God looks at me, he does not see some kind of righteousness or goodness that's been infused, that God has just made me a little better, and because I'm a little better, I'm acceptable before him. No, when he looks at me, he sees his son, Jesus Christ. He sees the blood. He sees his righteousness that is not my own, but is given to me. And so there's nothing worthy within us. None of us can stand with our heads high, proud, boasting of our goodness. There's no goodness within us apart from God. And even then, he only sees Jesus. You know, since it, it cannot be earned, God gives it as a gift to repenting sinners who put that trust in him. But you know, the self-righteous pride of the Pharisee and those like him only increased his alienation from God. His proudness and what the devil was even doing in the midst of that was actually distancing himself. He thought he was okay. How many people do we know in our lives right now that just think they're okay with God, but we know just by definition of, of fruit and just by definition of the scriptures, we know that they are far from God. Family members that think that they're okay. But they are trusting in their own goodness and righteousness. They are not looking to Jesus. It calls us to pray. You know, Scripture never says that, that we are justified because of some kind of goodness of our faith. As if our faith merits acceptance before God. No, no, the scriptures never allow us to think that our faith in itself earns favor with God. Rather, the scripture says we are justified by means of our faith. Understanding faith to be the instrument which justification is given to us, but not at all an activity that earns us merit or even favor with God. Rather, we are justified solely because of the merits of Christ's work. I mean, have you ever wondered, and, and we're getting to the end, have you ever wondered why God chose faith to be the attitude of heart by which we obtain justification? Now think about it just, just for a second. Why, why could God not have decided to give justification to all those who just sincerely uh, sow love in the world or, or give love to others or, or show joy or, or, or to show contentment or, or to show humility or wisdom? Why did God choose faith as the means by which we receive justification? It's because faith is the one attitude of heart that is the exact, exact opposite of depending on ourselves. When we come to Christ in faith, we essentially say, I give up. When you and I come to Christ in faith, we are saying, I, I give up. I, I will not depend on myself or my own works any longer. I, I know that, that I can never make myself righteous before God. You're, you're giving up. That's what faith 
really is. Therefore, Jesus, as, as I trust you, I, I'm depending on you completely. It's on you that I have a righteous standing before God. It's not on me. It's only in you. You know, in this way, faith is the exact opposite of trusting in ourselves. And therefore, is the attitude that perfectly fits salvation, that depends not at all on our own merit, but entirely on God's free gift of grace given to you. The work of, of Jesus, obviously on the cross, hasn't happened at this point. And so the salvation of the tax collector was an Old Testament pre-cross conversion. His faith is clearly seen. God, be merciful to me. God, I can't, I can't bring my own mercy. I can't get my own mercy. I can't buy my own mercy. I can't be good enough for my own mercy. God, my faith is in you. Be merciful to me, the sinner. God, I'm depending on you. Look at the last part of verse 14. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Jesus closes his, his story with kind of like a, a proverb. Exalted, that you see in this context in verse 14, uh, is a synonym really for, for salvation. And so we see the one who humbles himself will be, be saved is what Jesus is saying. He's the one that's going to be in the, the spiritual kingdom. In the Old Testament usage, only God is truly exalted. Only God can exalt men who, who are un, unable to exalt themselves really to his level. And thus everyone, as we see it, who exalts himself will be humbled in the, ser, in the severest sense really of the word. It's, it's kind of like they are crushed. If you're exalting yourself in this life, you, you will be crushed in, in the next. There is eternal loss. There, there, is, there is punishment. Jesus is saying that the path of, of self-exaltation ends up in judgment. That's the path. That's the direction. That's where they're going. You think of James 4, 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. But, but on the other hand, as we see, that all who humble themselves and confess that they can do nothing to save themselves will be exalted to, external, or to, to eternal glory. I mean, think about it for a moment. The, the damned think that they are good. The saved, they think that they are wicked. I mean, that's what this text is, is getting at. Those that are lost believe that the kingdom of God is for those who are worthy of it. The saved uh, know that the kingdom of God is for those who know that they are unworthy of it. Jesus is giving a, a contrast. The lost believe that they earn eternal life. But you notice there, the saved know it's a free gift. Those that are lost, they find God's judgment and wrath and condemnation. But the saved are the ones that seek his Forgiveness. The saved are the ones that, that are humble to admit that they have a, a desperate need that only God can fill. And they're looking to Christ. I mean, Jesus coming, this, this Advent season, brings us face to face with the lies that we believe. The lies that we think that we can live a good life independent of our Creator. The world is consumed with it. You know, if we are capable of being what we're supposed to be and doing what we were supposed to do, designed to do, then there would be no need for Jesus to come. But Jesus came because we are broken. Jesus came because we are the boasters who self-exalt. We are the boasters who proclaim to be something that we're really not. And those that are saved, they know that they must humble themselves in the sight of the Lord. They know that they must decrease so God increases. And that is the difference. The, the birth of Jesus is an attack on our self-sufficiency. We are not good enough, smart enough. We can't get out of this situation. 
the birth of Jesus kind of yells at us in this season that we need someone to come to our aid. What does it yell for you? I mean, who is Jesus to you? I mean, Jesus came as a baby to live and die and rise again, to push back against us, our way, our life, our self-promotion. But the, the Christmas story doesn't just confront us with our need. It also gives us the helper in Jesus Christ. That Jesus is our helper in coming and dying and shedding his blood so that we might repent and believe in him. What are you believing in? I mean, do you sit here? Because it's not uncommon. We might sit here and think that, that we are good, righteous people. I'm not like my neighbors. I, I, I'm not like the, the domestic violence cases. I, I, I'm not like the drunk. I'm not like the, the sex addict. I, I'm not like, and you fill in the blank. And if that's what we're going for, then we feel self-righteous and we feel good enough. But you know what? The Bible says that all our works are like filthy rags. They are like rubbish that we must reject to gain Christ. You know, is there something in your life this morning that you need to reject, that you need to drop, that you need to walk away from so that you can cling to Jesus? Maybe as a person sitting here, you've thought, you know, I've been good for 40 years. You know, there's going to be a lot of good people that go to hell because their faith was in their goodness and not in the one who shed his blood for them, the perfect sacrifice. The sacrifice that ended all other sacrifices was Jesus Christ, and he sacrificed himself for you. So do what with that? What would God want us to do? Repent and submit yourself to him. Depend on him. Let's pray together. Our Father, We thank you for Jesus, who is our righteousness. That his perfect righteousness has been imputed to us. That he was the payment, the propitiation for our sins. That God, there is nothing good in us. God, as much as we try to change ourselves, as much as we try to modify our behavior, we know that we can't do it on our own. That we constantly go back to our old patterns of life. But Lord, thank you that it's through Jesus that you make all things new. God, that you give us the ability and the power through the Holy Spirit to take off the flesh and to put on Christ, to put on the Spirit. And God, I pray this morning as your word has been preached, and as we listen, that, that our ears have been opened, but God, that, that really the, the word would echo within our hearts and minds. That, Lord, if there's anything within us that thinks that that our works merit salvation and merit righteousness and and merit heaven, that, that we would see how wrong we are. God, that we would confess our desperation, that we are sinners and we are in desperate need of your mercy. So God, if there's someone here that doesn't know you or someone watching that that doesn't know you and God, you are tugging at their heart and pulling them to yourself, God, I pray that in boldness and courage they would cry out in repentance to you. God, thank you for your mercy to us. And Lord, help us. Help us as, as Christians, Lord, that we wouldn't get into this horizontal comparison game in, in life, Lord, that we wouldn't look at others and desire what they have, God, that we would find our contentment in you. God, that we wouldn't manipulate relationships just to get ahead or just to get what we want, that we would be content in you. God, thank you for your son. May we rest in him. May we submit to him. May he be glorified through our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This time we're going to stand in time of worship. You can come and pray. Sit where you are. Need Christ? You know what? You need Christ today? We're going to have someone standing in the back. I know it's COVID. Who cares? If you need Jesus today, and I don't mean it like that. I'm saying if you need the gospel, 
and you know your need for salvation, there is someone that's willing to talk with you. There is someone that is willing to open up the word with you. I don't want because COVID is going on that we stop sharing the gospel. And so if you need some help, some spiritual guidance, someone to pray with you, there's someone in the back that would love to do that. And so as we sing, you take whatever step God's asking of you. benediction which comes from Romans 16 verses 25 through 27 which says now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed and through the uh, prophetic writings um, has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith To the only wise God, be glory forever, forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. You are dismissed.